Scotland is changing. The population has never been higher. More than five million people live and work here. The country is more diverse, with more people speaking Polish than Gaelic at home. The ethnic mix is richer than ever. I find myself speaking with words like we. Scotland's industries are evolving and digital businesses booming. Engineering and old industries are being replaced by the new. The growth and the jobs and the amazing new stuff is here. More than two million foreign visitors a year are boosting the Scottish economy. You can swim in dolphins all over the world. This is where you get to swim in monsters. Wonderful. So how does modern Scotland work? What does it mean to be Scottish in 2015? How are Scotland's jobs and industries competing on a global stage? How do others see us? This series goes to the heart of contemporary Scottish life to reveal how Scotland works. Scotland was once an industrial powerhouse. But today, the world of work is changing. A new industrial revolution is transforming the Scottish economy, now worth almost £150 billion a year. More than two million Scots are in employment. Their working lives are very different from previous generations. So what are the new industries bringing jobs and prosperity to Scotland? And who are the innovative Scottish trailblazers building the businesses of the future? What do Scots want from their working lives? This is modern Scotland at work. Tobermory on the Isle of Mull, a traditional Scottish island community. Not the kind of place you would expect to find a high-tech revolution, but change is coming. This remote part of Scotland is about to be connected to the mainland and the world by a new internet service. Superfast fibre broadband. It promises to transform the working lives of people here. Until now, a slow connection to the internet has been damaging the local economy. This printing company, run by married couple Brian and Christine Swinbanks, is being affected by the slow internet service. We make jigsaw puzzles from photographs. We also make canvases for clients as well from photographs. And now this is just us working, and Chris, could you hold that for me? That's great. O on a new sign that we're doing for one of the hotels down the street here. So we're just taking off what we call the application tape. But, I mean, it's this, it's this lovely thing about making things, isn't it, Chris? I mean, there's something very satisfying in actually making something and seeing it for sale on a shop or on someone's wall and going around and knowing that you have actually helped make that product. We get a huge amount of data coming down the line to us. I mean, some of the biggest files that we've had from one of our graphic people that we work with in London was over 900 megabytes. So really, for us to have high-speed broadband will make a tremendous difference. A 45-minute ferry crossing separates Mull from the mainland. The island has just under 3,000 inhabitants. In the last decade, the population has been rising. More people are choosing to live and work here. Families are arriving in search of a better quality of life. And more young locals are opting to stay. The increase in population here has been dramatic. It's been good. And I think it's in part due to many of the things that are going on, many of the small industries, the increases in tourism. But they all demand. They demand instant communications nowadays. And that, that, that's critical to us all. It really is critical. All kinds of ventures are being held back by Mull's slow connection speeds, including Tober Mori's thriving artistic community. At the Antabar Art Centre, local musicians can perform and record. The facilities are equal to anything on the mainland, but the lack of a decent internet service 
is causing problems. Everybody's working at really high levels of quality and then you have to put it all on a hard drive and put it in an envelope and post it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quicker to, to walk to Glasgow with your, your information rather than try and send it down the, the line. So it can't come soon enough. We just want to be connected up with the, with the rest of the world. Everybody likes the remoteness of living here, but we want the best of both worlds. Now, at last, Mull is being hardwired to the network. It won't be the first time this part of Scotland has made communications history. In 1956, Oban became the landing point for the first ever transatlantic telephone cable. Now, it has become the hub of Scotland's newest fibre broadband network. This is one of the largest broadband rollout programmes in Europe, right across the highlands and islands of Scotland. Chief Engineer Bob Matthews is the man in charge of the project. So we so have got 15 minutes before we... So they're ready to go, yeah? I, I, I think most people think that a lot of communication is by satellite, whereas where it is, it's, it's certainly not now. Uh, I guess 99% 90, of, of communication is... is International communication? I thought to 95, but... Uh, no, yeah, 95 to 99 is, is by... Uh, these, these kind of cables, undersea cables. Cable is behind you, ready to, ready to start. Just waiting for the right time. Costing 145 million pounds, this project aims to connect at least 84% of homes and businesses in the region to fibre broadband by 2016. It's a huge engineering challenge for the workers who are laying the cable. The area to be covered is 15,000 square miles, the size of Belgium. Over 800 kilometres of land-based cable is being laid across the region. Spanning the water between the mainland and the islands is a trickier job. Over 400 kilometres of subsea cable will be laid underwater via 20 separate crossings to connect the outlying islands to the main network. So these are the 20 cables that we're installing as part of the project. So far we've delivered 17 of the cables. Uh, we're on the 18th one now. Main challenges I think are uh, a lot of this area is uh, primarily fishing grounds where we have uh, small fishermen and uh, fishing there, fishing for crab and prawns, etc. Uh, and the logistics of asking those people to move has been uh, quite, quite hard. This ship carries enough cable to cross an ocean. The crossing today is just eight miles. Even in summer, weather conditions can cause delays, but the team is on schedule. Once the cable has reached the island, it can finally be connected to the local network, linking Mull to the world via high-speed optical fiber. The data cable itself, wrapped in layers of protective steel, is just a couple of millimetres thick. That's the piece we went for after there, right in the centre. That's 48 fibres. Very small. Connection complete. Mull has been brought just a little bit closer to the world beyond its shores. That's quick. Yeah. Sheesh. For islands like Mull, the high-tech lifeline promises to transform the world of work. It will allow innovative local businesses to flourish. We were watching the boat yesterday, actually, laying the cables out in Tobemori Bay, and, and, you know, it will make... It's like the second revolution in Tobemori. I mean, the first revolution to me was the steamers and the steamships that came through Tobemori, and they touched all the towns, and they made such a difference because this linked all the highlands and islands. It linked all the small ports, and at the same time, from about 1820 to 1850, you saw a massive expansion. In Campbelltown, you saw it in Oban, you saw it in many other ports up and down the west coast of Scotland. 
And I think with digital broadband, this is going to be the second revolution. In the highlands and islands, jobs and prosperity are being boosted by technology. On the mainland, it's also having a major impact. For years, ambitious Scots were forced to leave for London or overseas to compete in the global market, or to become what are known as willies, people who work in London but live in Edinburgh. But today, more Scots are pursuing high-flying careers at home and creating the Scottish industries of the future. Scotland is becoming a global force in computing. Around 70,000 Scots now work in the digital industries. Companies like Edinburgh-based Rockstar North are making Scotland a world leader in computer games. The latest edition of their Grand Theft Auto game smashed records to make one billion dollars in just three days. For a new generation of Scottish entrepreneurs, all this means one thing, a massive opportunity. Investor Jamie Coleman is a man with a vision. He wants to help build new Scottish technology companies that have the potential to go global fast. When you think about the startup communities and what's really happening across the world, and clearly people think of Silicon Valley and so on, but the reality is that what we are building here um, are the new businesses. They are the new ways of working. Um, you know, when you're when your mammy told you that you should be a doctor or a lawyer, those days are over, okay? The growth and the jobs and the amazing new stuff is here. Jamie sees Scotland as a place where the really hard programming problems of the future are being solved. There are other places in the world that may be good at other stuff, but Scots are great at doing the big, hard, heavy lifting. When I think of the Industrial Revolution heritage of heavy engineering, um, in a way, that's now moved into the software space. So our, the young people that are coming through here are building big, hard, heavy, as Americans would say, gnarly stuff. But they're doing it in software. To help kickstart the Scottish tech businesses of the future, Jamie has created a space in the heart of Edinburgh, Scotland's Silicon Valley. Two years ago, this 1960s office block was lying empty and facing possible demolition. Today, Jamie has transformed it into the biggest cluster of new technology companies in the UK. He calls it Codebase. We opened on the 1st of March. We've doubled in size since then. We're now the largest tech incubator in the UK. Uh, we've got uh, over 42 companies and about to be a whole lot more. There are over 300 people in with us and relatively young. The mean age is 27. Jamie assesses new companies who apply for space based on their potential for growth. What I'm interested in is helping to build, grow and really properly scale uh, the next billion dollar tech companies. The companies based here are all working with technology, but their products are very different. So these guys in here are called EO Surgical. They're practicing surgeons who are currently operating on patients. And in the evenings they come in and they've got a hardware software play that uh, monitors the mo fine-grained movements of surgical instruments. We've got Chelsea Apps Factory, enterprise-class mobile apps. We've got e-commerce developers GetSquare are in here. We've got Sodash.com, Zone Fox is a security tool uh, which monitors people hacking into your networks and leaking information out of your networks. There's a huge amount of interest in how do you look at that. We just had a uh, 500k extra investment into them in a few weeks ago and uh, and hopefully that will allow them to really scale now that the Americans and, and other parts of the world are starting to work out what they've built. Many of these companies have a global reach and they attract talent from all over the world to Scotland. Having so many businesses together who, while they're, we're doing wildly different things, are all in similar places in their company's life cycle it makes a huge difference. There is something inherently lonely about starting a company that very few people who aren't doing this can understand. Peekaboo's product should appeal to everyone, 
It could change the way that all of us use our phones. The general idea of what we build uh, and what we've got here is a system that we can train to look at stuff with a camera and remember what it is. We want to take passwords, which are a pain, and turn them into the simplest interaction possible. You can draw a picture on just about anything, like these cards here, and when you go to a website uh, to log in, you'd just be confronted, instead of a password field, you'd be able to take a picture. So something as simple and as random as this. It could be on a post-it note, sheet of A4, or even a photograph that you keep in your wallet, whatever it is, and you hold it up, um, and right away, it remembers who we are within about a second and uh, immediately gets you where you need to be. Incubators like this give companies like Peekaboo space to evolve, and they're helping to put Scotland on the technological map. What Scotland's got is this right mix of, of people and of resources and of passion for this kind of work that, that means that we have a real... We have the germ of a real community here around this digital revolution. It fits with that ethos of, of the changing world, of the way that uh, this engineering and old industries are being replaced by the new in a really fundamental way. Starting any new business is risky. For every success story, many others will fail. But Jamie's vision is more than a pipe dream. Just down the road is a massive Scottish success story that shows what's possible. Edinburgh-based flight comparison website, Skyscanner. In 2013, the company was valued at £500 million. Founded in 2001 by three computer programmers, it's on course to become Scotland's first billion-pound tech business. They are hiring the cream of Scotland's programming talent to help them grow. 21-year-old graduate Ryan is starting his first real job as a programmer at Skyscanner's Edinburgh HQ. How's it going? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? You good? You good? What are you working on today? Uh, just uh, doing the car hire campaign for the US market. When you look on the television and you see all of the big companies like Facebook and Google all over in America, you assume that that's where the big technology happens. And I went into university thinking exactly the same. And as I, I went through my studies, I realised that I wouldn't need to move anywhere to do the level of work um, that these other companies do. It's right here in Scotland. And we're riding the front of what could be a massive wave here. This isn't a specialist technology company. Its website is for ordinary customers looking for bargain flights. Crucially, those customers aren't just in Scotland, but worldwide. Being online gives Skyscanner and other Scottish companies like it a potential customer base of 7 billion people. This 21st century Scottish factory shows how times have changed. Heavy industry has gone, and new ways of working have replaced the old. There is this conception that Scotland doesn't make anything anymore. But if you look around here, what we make now is technology. And we make it really well, and we make a lot of it. Um, through in Glasgow, there's a lot of banks. Up north in Dundee, there's a lot of games. It's all technology. It's not as tangible as a ship is. But there's certainly there's a lot of production still happening in Scotland. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's great. And in 21st century Scotland, innovation is crucial for every industry, even the most traditional. Farming has been at the heart of Scottish working life for thousands of years. Today, it's big business. 73% of Scotland's land is given over to agriculture, over 13 million acres. Six and a half million sheep, almost two million cattle, and 300,000 pigs grow fat on the land. And every year, Scotland grows more than one million tonnes of potatoes. But making a profit from traditional farming can be challenging. Prices fluctuate and bad weather can be devastating. To stay competitive, some Scottish farmers are turning to technology. Alan Stevenson's family have farmed this land in East Lothian for generations. He grew up here, but left for a career in business. Now, he has returned, and he's on a mission to turn the family farm into a model for Scottish agriculture in the 21st century. I was born here. This is the hundredth year since my grandfather came to East Lothian from Ayrshire. And a uh, hundred years ago, he grew his first crop of potatoes over in this field over here. 
just felt the tug of uh, my heritage, an emotional appeal to come back here um, and uh, continue to build the business. And things have changed massively in the 100 years, including the fact that we've now got modern buildings. Alan now grows a range of Scottish veg destined for supermarket shelves. Uh, this field here is one of our best fields, right on the farm at the door. And in here we've got parsnips. And we're growing these parsnips specifically for Aldi, um, who are looking for a Scottish um, provenance. They want to be able to pack a parsnip that was grown and sourced in Scotland. Alan has developed a long-term plan to make his farm one of the most innovative and competitive in the country. Innovation has been fundamental to our way of trying to move forward and do things better for the customers, more efficiently, at lower costs. He's focusing on potatoes. These fields produce some of the best potatoes in the UK. A high-tech harvester ensures every one is picked and graded. The tractor is guided by GPS. The cab contains a bank of computers. Pretty straightforward, touch screen, big buttons. You know, there's a map of the field, once my guidance line's there, which is there from the planting time when we set the ridges out. I come back in the field and all I have to do is press sort of go and it steers itself. Um, so then that gives me all my time then just watching the cameras and making sure the potatoes are coming out of the ground and into the box. Despite all this technology, there's still a need for human beings to get involved. Many of the manual workers who bring in Scotland's harvest come from abroad. But on this farm today, local workers are on shift. They've had to adapt to these new ways of working. Originally I thought I was uh, harvesting potatoes, I was going to come to the farm and be down on my knees sort of picking potatoes out the ground, but I never knew this sort of technology existed, to be honest. It's all completely new. This kind of futuristic farming kit isn't cheap. But Alan and his staff believe that this is the future and that they must change with the times or be left behind. We've justified and sat round the table, what can we do to be in the game? It is now about last man standing. You've got to have the attitude for change. And farming sometimes in the primary, primary sector is maybe possibly stuck in the same gear for too long. It can't afford to stay in the same gear, just like any other industry. Alan's passion for agricultural innovation has made him a global ambassador for high-tech potato farming. And around the world, people are paying attention. Today, an agricultural scientist working for China's biggest potato producer is visiting to see cutting-edge Scottish farming for himself. His name is Doctor Hu. Today we brought Doctor Hu from a, a Chinese potato company called Shizhen Potatoes, and it's China's largest for uh, propagating potatoes. And we want to translate some of that potato technology to China. Uh, we do believe, I believe, we have some opportunities to, to develop a For cooperation? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. No stone, very fertile land, yeah. with moisture, and it has a history of growing potatoes for a long time. The future is bright because we have prime land, and farming goes in ups and downs. And because we've made the investment and managed to make the investment during the hard times, we will enjoy the good times. Everything on this farm is geared around sustainability and efficiency. Even the storage shed is state of the art. It uses renewable energy generated on the farm and it has an intelligent climate control system that keeps the potatoes in perfect condition. This cold store was designed to be extremely energy efficient. What we need to do is bring the crop in and then bring the temperature of the potatoes down gradually over a couple of weeks. So therefore we will be investing in a lot of energy and chilling capacity to both dry and gradually cool down the potatoes. The type of equipment and technology we've got in the back of this store for distributing air around the building and the walls with high insulation in them um, is, is designed 
uh, to minimize the cost that it takes to hold the potatoes in here at around about three and a half degrees through the winter. Farming is just one of the traditional Scottish industries being reshaped by science and technology. And it's a key element in one of modern Scotland's biggest industrial success stories, food and drink, which has replaced heavy industry to become the country's biggest manufacturing sector. Scottish food businesses turn over £9 billion a year and employ 50,000 people. This is projected to keep growing. Produce like beef, salmon and even porridge are creating jobs and boosting the economy right across the country. But despite all the technological advances, there's one traditional Scottish food industry that is still a very risky business. Fishing. Lying off the northeast tip of Scotland, Orkney is a land apart. These islands have been inhabited since the Stone Age. And since ancient times, fishing has been in the lifeblood of the people here. 27-year-old Jimmy Dakin is starting his career on the boats. It was either a toss-up between farm work or fishing, and fishing just seemed most appealing to me at the time. So that's what I went for. Better than being cooped up in a factory or an office. Jimmy's working week starts early. 5 a.m. This is what you have to do to go out and earn a penny. You've got to get up. Jimmy crews on a boat that fishes the deep water of the North Sea. He's away for several days at a time, in all weathers. Fishing is still one of the most dangerous occupations. In the last 10 years, Almost 100 British fishermen lost their lives at sea, so each trip out has one key aim. Getting back at the end of the week, landing our stuff, getting ashore, you know, every, everyone's back safe and no one's been hurt. And obviously being out on the sea, the freedom, just being out on the seas. Get the catch ashore, get it all ashore fresh and alive, and we're gonna get paid for it. If it goes ashore dead, then we don't get paid. Probably going to be away for about three or four days now. Then maybe come back, have a day off. And then uh, do it all again. It's a vicious cycle, this working. Traditional deep sea fishing is still a key part of the Scottish economy. These wild waters are full of valuable seafood. Scotland's annual catch is worth more than 400 million pounds. But margins are tight. Hi Douglas, time to get up now. This is the best bit about being a fisherman. To save money on fuel, boats like this one go to sea for days at a time. There's no guarantee they'll catch enough to make a profit. For young fishermen like Jimmy, a future in this traditional Scottish industry is far from secure. So today, some seafood producers are rethinking the business of fishing altogether. While Orkney's sea fishing fleet has been shrinking each year, fish farming is booming. Salmon production has doubled in a decade. And all around Scotland's coast, new ways of harvesting wild seafood are changing the fishing business. The Isle of Mull is surrounded by some of the clearest waters in Europe. Intensive fishing has taken its toll on marine life. But this is still the home of one particularly valuable bivalve, the scallop. Here, fisherman Guy Grieve runs his business harvesting wild scallops in the most sustainable way possible. Okay, and go. 
hand diving. The length of dives depend very much on the, how much current there is, how hard you have to swim, how deep you are, how shallow you are. If it's a shallow dive, you'll swim for a long time, up to maybe an hour, an hour and 20 minutes. If it's quite a deep dive, then you're, gonna, you're not going to be down for that long. For years, overfishing decimated stocks of seafood around Scotland's coasts. Guy and his team saw that a new approach was needed if stocks were to have the chance to recover. I remember when I first started diving around here, we would see a great variety of, of sea life, fish and, and crustaceans and various corals and weeds and stuff that you just don't see anymore. But we used to go in and if we saw monkfish, if it wasn't big enough, we wouldn't take it. You know, we'd wait until we saw a big enough monkfish, but I can't remember the last time I saw monkfish around here, you know? You don't see them anymore. Because the, the spawning grounds have been destroyed and the, the general marine environment has just degraded. We see this every time we go in the water. We see the results of this every time we dive, every working day. It's heartbreaking. Guy is at the vanguard of a new, more sustainable approach to fishing, which aims to protect Scotland's valuable marine environment. What working people need and working communities need to do, and Scotland is perfect for this, is to create high-value uh, luxury seafoods. And the, the guys doing it up and down the west coast of Scotland, not just the diving, there's beautiful creole fishing going on, there's fantastic fish farming going on with uh, mussels and oysters. There's a hell of a lot of beautiful food being created in Scotland. These artisan ways of producing food, I believe, instead of being an anachronistic thing of the past, this is the future, small-scale food production of a high value. The market for Scottish seafood is also changing. Much of it is still exported. France, Spain and Italy take most of Scotland's shellfish. And the biggest market for salmon is America, worth £200 million a year. But seafood is getting more popular at home. So Guy doesn't send his scallops abroad. They are destined for Britain's top restaurants. Many of them in Scotland as well as a few discerning chippies. OK, that's our man up. You've got to love what you're bringing to your chefs, because otherwise it just becomes a commodity that you treat like trash. It doesn't matter to you. This one really does matter to us. You know, it, it, to me, it's always a miracle. You know, we send out 5,000 of these every week. And to me, there is something quite miraculous about the fact that every one of these was picked up by a man's hand. And that means a, a great deal to all of us. Um, you know, there's a real sense that when you get these through diving, uh, it feels like you're, you're picking the apples without trampling the flowers. And that is the, the key point with diving for scallops, and that's what drives us crazy about them. With seafood, freshness is key. Once the week's scallops have been packed, it's a race against time to get them delivered in prime condition. A lot of our scallops are packed for London. They, get, they head down to London. They get to um, London tomorrow morning at about 3 in the morning and then our driver in London picks them up and delivers them to all our restaurants in London. And if they're late, the ferry won't wait. Aha, here's our van. Thank God, we've got eight minutes to leave this pier. The week's catch is dispatched to the ferry, just in time. From seabed to plate, in less than 24 hours, these scallops are world class. Some of them are heading for a world famous Scottish establishment. Glen Eagles Hotel. Andrew Fairley is Scotland's top chef. His restaurant inside Glen Eagles is the only two Michelin starred establishment in the country. Every ingredient has to be of the highest quality. He used to source from abroad, but today homegrown Scottish produce can meet his exacting standards. In food terms, Scotland has completely reinvented itself and its whole attitude to food, the diversity of food, people's appreciation of food, it is now a world internationally recognized food destination, not just for the ingredients, but we've got some of the best restaurants in Europe here in Scotland now. People, when they come to the restaurant, they expect it to be Scottish. When they're in the middle of Persia, 
you know, they look out the window and they can see beef, cattle, they can see lamb, they can see mushrooms, they can see it, so that they expect and they want you as a chef to make the effort to source it the best that you possibly can and then they want to eat it. I can buy ducks down the road that are every bit as good, if not better, than anything I can buy in France and they pride themselves on their poultry. And we used to buy all our poultry from France. Now we buy everything, everything from Scotland. So there is a huge realisation in the artisanal producers in Scotland now that there is a massive market out there for it. It's not just traditional Scottish produce that is inspiring Scotland's chefs. More unusual native ingredients are being rediscovered, like seaweed. I never associated it with Scotland until I'd been to Japan, saw what they were using as seaweed and thought, well, surely we can get this in Scotland coming back from Japan and then looking at it and it was everywhere. Scallops and seaweed are combined to create a dish from Scotland's wild waters. So that's it. Hand dive scallops from Mull. Selection of Scottish seaweeds with a Scottish dashi broth. Simple as that. Andrew's restaurant and the hotel are aimed at the top end of the market. But right across Scotland, from humble pubs to five-star hotels, hospitality has become huge business and a huge employer and trainer of staff. Hospitality is particularly important in Scotland's rural areas. Here at Glen Eagles, hundreds of local jobs depend on it. This iconic Perthshire resort was built in 1924 as a luxury destination for railway travellers to the Highlands. Today, Glen Eagles offers a distinctive Scottish experience with golf, fishing and even falconry. The hotel has over 200 bedrooms and it employs up to 900 staff from the front desk to the kitchens. This makes it one of the biggest employers in the area. The hotel's rural location means everything has to be done in-house, even flower arranging. Head florist John MacDonald grew up in the area and first worked here as a teenager. Now he has come back to keep Glen Eagles in bloom. We do all the flowers in the hotel. We have flowers in the main restaurants. Uh, we have flowers in the toilets, in the bedrooms. So that's something that we're constantly keeping an eye on, having to check and renew. People are always quite surprised that there's a florist, but they're more surprised to find that there's more than one. We're actually a team of five people. Uh, we work in the hotel and we're based in a workroom at the back of the hotel. Glen Eagles is quite geographically isolated, so if we were a five-star hotel in London, uh, you've got lots of florists and lots of companies that would do event flowers. But here, really, Edinburgh and Glasgow, they're, they're both an hour away. So having someone in-house actually solves a lot of problems. Back in the 80s, we had a lot of Americans used to come. Now, I mean, probably the majority of our customers come from the south of England. So just as I go on holiday, I might take my caravan and go down to the south of England. They like to come and go somewhere totally different as well. Glen Eagles managing director, Patrick Ellsmey, has seen how Scotland's hospitality industry has evolved over the years. I've been in this industry a long time here in Scotland, and um, looking back on it, um, we've come a long way. Uh, we've got wonderful restaurants, we've got wonderful uh, boutique hotels, we've got wonderful uh, places that you can stay at in the wilds of Scotland that still offer great, great service and really fabulous um, facilities and amenities within them that just weren't there 30 years ago. If you're living in the middle of Glasgow or the back end of Dundee, you're probably not thinking about tourists, but they do come here in big numbers and it is really, really important. It's also a, an industry where people can, if they have the right attitude, the right desire, they can be very successful in it. You know, it, 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 it's about people, and if you like working with people, you can be very successful in it. Just keeping all those visitors fed is a big job. We marinate the fruits for a month, and then um, after that we mix them up in the mixing machine. Head pastry chef Neil Mugg is preparing for one of the busiest times of the year, Christmas. From the two mixes, we'll make approximately between 90 and 110 two-pound Christmas puddings, and then we'll make probably about 50 or 60 one-pound Christmas puddings. 
The recipe, um, to be honest with you, I'm not going to lie, um, it's not my recipe, it's a recipe that's been used at Glen Eagles for over 25 years, and I've just carried on using it because it was better than mine. Like all the staff here, Neil knows that in the hospitality business, maintaining high standards is key. I think, you know, we've built up a business um, in Glen Eagles um, based on consistency. Um, there's nothing worse than going to any business um, and being good two days a week, not so good three days a week and brilliant the rest of the, the week, you know. I used to work in a country house hotel in my first job and the manager there was very, very proper. And um, what she always used to say was, as soon as you put on your uniform, you're on stage, dear. This is what she used to say. And the other thing that she taught me, one of the first things, and it's one thing that I always echo to other people as well, is you work in a business like Glen Eagles, where there's so many different cultures and nationalities coming through the door, and what we would say is a smile is the same in any language. Hotels like Glen Eagles are part of another industrial revolution that has changed how Scotland works. The rise of the service sector. Like many European countries, much of our economy is now based not on what we make, but on what we can do for other people. From hospitality, catering and retail, to legal, technical and financial services, these businesses are now employing hundreds of thousands of Scots. Together, they are worth £84 billion pounds a year and rising. For young people coming into work, this is where many jobs are to be found. Here on the River Clyde, we once built ships that would cross the world. Today, Glasgow is at the forefront of a very different kind of global business. They used to be known as call centres. Since the advent of online communication, they are now called contact centres. Glasgow is home to around 30 contact centres. They provide customer services for some of the world's biggest firms, including banks, supermarkets, telecoms providers and insurance companies. In this office, and more than 400 like it across Scotland, workers answer inquiries by phone, email and via social media. Teleperformance is the worldwide leader in customer service. In Scotland, we've been around for quite a long time. We have a number of different sites in Scotland where we're supporting customers for um, some of the UK's leading brands. The service sector in Scotland is such a huge part of what makes up our economy now. And if we were to rewind 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, that would be a very different situation. Over 100,000 Scots now work in this industry. And as more big businesses choose to use Scottish-based contact centres, skilled workers are increasingly in demand. Companies like Teleperformance have to be proactive in the ways they recruit new staff. So they offer unemployed people training to help them get off the dole and into a job. Today, a group of potential new recruits are being assessed. Oh, hello. How are we all? Yeah, good. It's starting in November. Anyone get any questions? No? OK. Not everyone here today will be offered a job. And then there's a letter writing exercise, OK? So use your own style and your own language. Um, you'll be scored on spelling, grammar and punctuation. But the idea is that with a bit of help, they will be able to sign off and start a new career. So how do you think you got on today? Yeah, I was quite confident. Yep. My answers. Um, you have passed. OK, so we will get in contact with you before close of play on Tuesday. So One of the successful you. candidates is 19-year-old Amy from East Kilbride. <laughs> Amy has only been unemployed for a few weeks, but she's happy to be getting back to work. Everybody wants to work. I don't see you. I don't know why MD wouldn't want to. I really don't, because I think it's quite... It's quite a boring life if you don't have anything to get up for in the morning. You do the same things over and over again, and you keep saying to yourself, well, what can I do today to take up my time? That's me. But while Amy is keen to get started, she doesn't quite know what to expect. I don't know what my first day is going to be like. 
it's probably going to be a wee bit nervous. I think the scariest thing I'm, I'm worried about is, see, every time you answer the phone, you introduce yourself and say what you need to say. I'm scared in case I just pick up the phone and I'm like, hi. For Amy, the contact centre offers the prospect of a long-term career. She might start by answering phones, but she's already got her eye on promotion. I'd like to move up in the company, because there is lots of room for improvement. Uh, there's lots of chances to step up and do all different kind of things within the business. I'll miss my dogs when I start working full time, because I'm used to having been with them all day, every day. Will you miss me when I go to work? Yes? Junior. For some of the other candidates, the prospect of a job is even more significant. Working alongside Amy will be 20-year-old Chantelle from Airdrie. She's been unemployed since leaving school and has found herself stuck in a rut. I'm getting up and I'm working, getting out. I enjoy getting out. Um, I enjoyed that two weeks course with Teleperformance. I really enjoyed that, getting out instead of sitting out. But because I have nothing to do, I generally sleep out in the afternoon. But it would be good to get up and get out. No Today, Chantelle is finally leaving the job centre behind. Her little sister goes with her for the last time. You see, Kayle? Um, I'm just going to sign off, hopefully. Um, so I start that new job, new job on Wednesday. It's the length of time I've been on the job centre and no getting anywhere. And then finally getting somewhere with a job. So it's quite, quite overjoyed, to be honest. Right. Yeah. All sorted and start my job on Wednesday. That should be me. All sorted. Right, Mum, we'll walk. Young Scots aged 16 to 24 are the group most likely to be unemployed. Many have never worked, but employment rates in the contact centre industry are high. For Chantelle, this should be an opportunity to get on a promising career path. There is jobs out there for people, but it's just basically looking for experience. But for young ones like my, my age, like 15, they don't have a lot of experience. They'd get out and come for school and try to get out, but nobody's given the opportunity. I, I will be quite nerve-wracking, um, so I will be nervous and I will be panicking. Um, it's just a case of getting used to it and try to get into the, the swingy, the working life, as people call it. The first day at any new job can be daunting. Today, Amy will be answering calls from the public for the first time. I'm a wee bit nervous, but I'm excited at the same time. So um, it'll be good to eventually get in and get started, because the training was long. <laughs> what are you nervous about? Just taking that first call. Chantelle is also starting work today. Unlike Amy, she has never had a job before. This is a big step. Hundreds of people work in this building, responding to customer queries and complaints on behalf of some of Britain's biggest companies. The standard of service they offer has to be high. Chantelle and Amy are thrown in at the deep end. Good afternoon, store reception. You're through to Amy. How can I help you? I'll just check to make sure that's in for you. I, I do apologise. Really, I, I, I can't say, I can't say to you. I'm not able to do that for you. Okay, have a nice day. Thanks for your call. Bye. After a few hours on the phones, the girls get a break. My first call was scary. I was like, try to put them on hold, take them off hold, put them on hold. And I didn't even realise I was doing that. And then as soon as I got them through, I hung up. I was like, they've hung up me. And then I looked at the, the computer, I was like, no, I hung up on them. You have your first call, nervous, and you'd be fine next day. No, I'm nervous on every single call that comes in. But no, I like, I like being out working. You don't get a minute. When a call goes off, you have another call coming straight back in. It needs to be real, it needs to be human, and the people that work here need to be from every single walk of life. Yes, we want them to do things in a way that um, is professional and, um, and courteous, but we don't want people to change and come in and talk a certain way. We don't want people to, um, to lose their individuality. Now, I don't think I could go back to sitting about the house all day. It's so boring. We're here, you feel important, you feel like they want you here, which is good. From contact centres to high-tech startups, from the field to the sea, 
Scotland's new jobs and industries are changing the ways people work. And there is one other Scottish workplace that is looking to the future and starting its own revolution. It's where 700,000 hard-working young Scots graft each day without pay. School. Scotland has always valued education. But in today's fast-changing world, Scottish schools are in need of a reboot. So across the country, a new generation of schools for the future is being built at a cost of one and a quarter billion pounds. 17 have already been built. 14 more are under construction. These new buildings will turn the traditional image of school on its head. The big idea behind this nationwide project is to prepare students for the 21st century workplace. Once, school trained pupils for a job in a factory or an office. That job would probably be for life. Today, the skills young people need to get ahead are very different. They need to be flexible, creative, self-motivated. So education needs to acknowledge this and make the experience of school more like the modern world of work outside. Portobello High in Edinburgh is one of the next schools scheduled for demolition and rebuilding. For some students, it's not a moment too soon. It's not a pretty building at all. I mean, they didn't even decide to give the school a nice colour. They just kind of chose beige and more shades of beige. Sometimes when a draft gets in the main building, the tiles of the roof go up and down, and sometimes they fall out and then the music corridor collapsed a while ago on some first year people's. No one was hurt, but like, you don't want to be here. It's not great. The new school's programme also aims to give pupils a say in the planning process. They have been asked to think about how different kinds of spaces could change the way they learn. Today, a team of architects have come to Portobello to find out what pupils think of the designs. Today, there's loads of really exciting things going on in the school programme in Scotland. There's a lot of authorities being really innovative about how they build their new schools, looking towards the next 50 years and not looking back to how schools used to be. Say what you like about the ideas, say what you don't like about the ideas, feel happy to tear the ideas apart. Like, it, if you had like five friends and it was a four-person table and there was no other tables there, you couldn't really do anything about it. Or if a student's doing a presentation here, maybe the beanbags allow you to kind of sit comfortably. I can't see all the teachers sitting on beanbags talking to the class. When I came into the first meeting, I was kind of thinking, like, we don't need fancy tables and things like that. And then when you think about the effect it could have on the learning and things like that, it's actually quite interesting to think there is more to it. The school building programme is also having an impact on other Scottish industries, in particular construction. The cost of building the new Portobello High School is projected to be £40 million. The project, and other schools being built across the country, will provide jobs for hundreds of Scottish builders, engineers and a host of other trades. It also boosts the number of apprenticeships available to local young people. On the other side of Edinburgh from Portobello, one of these new schools, James Gillespie's, is halfway to completion. It's a complex build on a tight city centre site, which involves demolishing and rebuilding the existing school in stages. Every morning, site manager John Allen conducts a safety briefing to make sure everyone knows what everyone else is doing. Okay, Peter. Hey, no issues. Jimmy. Infrastructure projects like this are helping Scotland's construction industry to grow. In 2014, by 10%. We can build anything. At the end of the day, for us, that's the easy bit. It's getting the design concluded. It's understanding what the client requires. Uh, once we're in a position we've got construction issue information, we can build it. Who was last in? So how much of a daughter is it? Um, it's not a doddle at all, no. You can sit in my chair for half a shift and see if you think it's a doddle. <laughs> Teacher Janice Kroll has been liaising between the school staff and pupils and the architects and builders for the past two years. The new design has 21st century technology built in. 
So we've got booths, we've got tables, we've got um, a touchdown area. So if you have a smartphone or if you have an iPad or whatever, you can just say uh, you can use the Wi-Fi. The whole place is going to be Wi-Fi. Oh. The fact of getting everyone together and getting everyone using the facilities and sharing the facilities and working together in the facilities, hopefully we'll get a great atmosphere going in the school of collaboration. Once again, the plans were developed in consultation with the students. It was brilliant. We could, we could say anything and they, they'd let you put it down. Like, we said goats and they actually said, OK, we can try for that. Yeah, and we also asked for a hot tub. It's their place of work. That's what education, their place of work. They've got to learn it. They're coming to be educated, but they've got to learn this is their work environment. Being aware of working in teams, collaborating, it's all so important. That's the skills you need for today's life. OK, this is your new school. As the first phase of the school nears completion, Janice gives two much. pupils a first look inside. So this is going to be the new library. So you walk in and there'll be the librarian's reception desk about here for getting all your books. And, and this is the art terrace. It's outside. It's outside. We have an outside terrace. We have an outside terrace. Oh, that's fancy. <laughs> I'm lost for words. <laughs> I think people have realised that um, it's not just a classroom, it's not just a blackboard, it's not just sitting in a row reading from a book. That is one way of learning. Probably not the best way of learning. Oh, well, privileged that we get this rather than just having a, an old building that we've been living in for a while. It's strange because we were so used to like old fashioned classrooms that just square a block where this is so different and open. It must be a far improved experience for the kids, you know, to come to a school like this, no doubt about it. So you might want to go back to school? Uh, not quite, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll just do what I do, thanks. <laughs> The Scottish education system is evolving to prepare the next generation of workers for a fast-changing world. Right across Scotland, new native businesses and big global companies are building a future for Scotland's economy and creating opportunities for young Scots as they start their working lives. Everybody wants that wee bit more success than what they've got. Everybody's always got that wee drive to do more. Well, I know I do anyway. I always want more. <laughs> but I think that I don't think that's a bad trait. It's how a lot of success people get where they are they now. Because if you give up, then you're never going to do what you want. For entrepreneurs like Jamie Coleman, it's creativity and innovation that will ensure Scotland's future prosperity. We can build these companies. It turns out we're really good at it. And it is the brain power and it is that cultural heritage of making stuff. We're great at that. Next time, how important is brand Scotland? This is just phenomenal. How do others see us? Perhaps the most famous bit of fresh water in the world and, and it's got a monster there. Wonderful. And who are the people that sell Scotland to the world? When they take that sip, that transports them to a country which they may have never visited, but which exists somewhere in their mind. Britain's railways, do we get value for money? Nick and Margaret discovered the trouble with our trains tomorrow at 9 o'clock. But next tonight, Florence and the Machine return with the Charlatans and James Taylor. Later with, live, with, later with Jules Holland is next.